So hello everyone. Good late morning. Uh, so my name is Anna Lapuk and um, I'm from the Vancouver Prostate Center. Uh, so I'm, I've been in bioinformatics for about uh, 10 years and uh, during these years I've been working on different cancer types uh, including breast, ovarian cancers, and glioblastoma, and now prostate cancer. So, but uh, my major research focus is um, using a high-resolution uh, technology such as microarrays and next-generation sequencing to develop new biomarkers and therapeutic targets and um, to bring them uh, um, into the translation applications, bring them to clinic. So I just have to say um, that today uh, the... Um, I will be talking about the integration of clinical data uh, with the high resolution, high dimensional data, about which you have heard um, during previous days of the course. And um, I have to say that I am by no means a biostatistician. I am a bioinformatician. I never was, and I don't have a, even the vaguest uh, intention to become one. I think that it's a very specialized area and it's for the high professionals um, to um, uh, represent that area and um, yet the material that I will be teaching today heavily depends on the basic statistical um, um, uh, questions um, or strategies and basically my goal is to deliver the uh, main meaning of those um, statistical um, uh, strategies to you so that you understand them and you are able to read the medical literature and understand um, what is done uh, from the statistical point of view um, in the literature and also you will have your hands on um, the lab during which you will uh, learn how to use uh, basic statistical uh, approaches um, to integrate clinical data with high dimensional data and so when you walk out of this room you will have a basic understanding which is quite important of these statistical concepts you will have some experience and then you will be able to ask uh, educated uh, questions to by statisticians um, if you are to perform any kind of research um, that incorporates those uh, statistical approaches which I highly recommend you to do. <clears throat> I will start with a very light introduction. I know that you are uh, must be pretty tired after all these days and uh, I will give you a very light introduction, very short introduction and then I will uh, gradually pick up and um, pick up speed and go over the statistical materials and uh, um, the rest of the materials uh, and I plan to spend about two, two and a half hours in lectures and then we'll have about two hours for the lab which will be important. So, let's start uh, with the overview of, of this particular, of this part of the module. So, I will start with the um, short introduction, as I said, and then in the second part, um, after the introduction, I will describe to you um, the um, basic um, concepts, how to go from molecular profiles to classification and prediction problems. Um, and I will also introduce you into um, a bit more specialized area mm -hmm. of um, classification studies, and that is a uh, drug response studies. So, uh, first of all, let's recall what the biomarkers and therapeutic targets are. Um, um, if you heard it um, during this course, that's great. We'll just uh, recall what they are. Uh, so, biomarker is a biological molecule found in blood, other body fluids, or tissues that is a sign of a normal or abnormal process or uh, of a condition or disease. A biomarker may be used to see, predict, how well the body responds to treatment for a disease or condition and also called molecular marker or signature molecule. What is the therapeutic target? It's also a biological molecule, an enzyme receptor or other protein that can be modified by an external stimulus. Um, the implication is that a molecule is hit by a signal and its behavior is thereby changed. So these are the definitions that we all need to know about. 
So throughout this course, you have heard a lot about different types of biomarkers, which would include point mutations or uh, genome copy number alterations, aberrant gene expression, aberrant transcript uh, uh, generation, such as fusions. So what is the purpose? of developing them and what is the ultimate use. So we can use biomarkers to classify tumors better, which may improve diagnosis. We can monitor change in certain markers and see how the disease progresses. We can see how the patient uh, will do in the future by predicting the disease recurrence, for instance. And then ultimately we can select appropriate therapy for a patient and then, if possible, predict the response to the therapy. So indeed, the ultimate goal is to select the most appropriate therapy that will be chosen on the basis of particular molecular characteristics of a tumor. Uh, however, as we know, molecular determinants um, of complex diseases such as cancer may differ from patient to patient, and therefore the uh, sciences such as um, genomics and genetics that search for um, disease-causing genes should always be concurring with a pharmacogenetic or pharmacogenomic studies that search for determinants of response to treatment. So what is the pharmacogenetics? Pharmacogenetics is the study of the role of inheritance in variation in drug response phenotypes. And these phenotypes can range from life-threatening adverse effects of, um, of a drug at one end of the spectrum to equally serious lack of therapeutic efficacy on the other. And over the past half century, uh, pharmacogenetics, like any other medical research field, um, has evolved from um, the discipline that was focusing on monogenetic traits to become a pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, I'm sorry, with a genome-wide perspective. So what is the origin of pharmacogenetics? Um, the earliest experimentally validated examples of an effect of inheritance on drug response were first reported half a century ago, even actually more than that, in 1950s and 1960s. And back then, researchers have noticed that uh, there were large differences in response to standard doses um, uh, that were given to different patients. And for example, in this table, I'm showing you two um, early examples. Um, one is the short-acting muscle relaxant. Uh, that was observed to be hydrolyzed differently in different subjects and that this variation was inherited. And then later it was discovered that the production of the dysfunctional enzyme, uh, BCHE enzyme, was responsible for this differential response in patients. And these patients were at significantly different risk of prolonged muscle paralysis, which is very serious, almost life-threatening side effect. Almost at the same time, uh, another drug, which was one of the first anti-tuberculosis drugs, um, isoniazid, was, um, no it was noticed that patients who were given standard doses um, had totally different plasma concentrations, and they were at the significantly different um, risk of developing adverse um, uh, reactions. And then later it was also discovered that uh, um, changes in the function of an enzyme, which was uh, which m is uh, metabolizing the drug, um, the enzyme NAT2, was responsible for these differences in patients. So, just one more example. Um, um, this is actually a uh, pharmacogenetic um, icon, so to speak. So, um, you probably know the chromosome P450 family of genes. It's a pretty large family um, of um, proteins that are involved in synthesis and metabolism of various molecules and chemicals within cells, including drugs. And then, CYP2D6 is a member of this family. Uh, and it's just really a, an outstanding example of, of that era. So it biotransforms um, a wide range of different drugs, and you can see how um, um, what a wide spectrum of different types of drugs um, it biotransforms. And then um, it was found later that there is a great number of genetic variation in, uh, in this particular gene in human population that can result in differential response to these drugs, these many drugs. And those genetic variations included non-synonymous coding SNPs associated with decreased activity. Um, in some instances it was gene deletion, in others it was gene duplication up to many copies. 
And so um, these alterations were linked to, um, to the uh, different rate of target drug metabolism. And here what you see is the plot of frequency distribution of ratio of a drug to its metabolite right here in a population um, of patients uh, which included poor metabolizers here the um, um, extensive metabolizers, which were the majority of the population, and ultra-rapid metabolizers. So these different people had different types of, um, have had different status of a function of um, CYP2D6. Um, and this resulted in different velocity of um, um, metabolism of the target drug by this enzyme. And so, um, Therefore, these um, subpopulations of patients may suffer from, um, um, from um, adverse um, reactions to, um, uh, to particular drugs. So, for instance, um, the poor metabolizers may suffer from excessive drug effect with drugs that are inactivated by this enzyme, or alternatively, they can suffer from inadequate drug effect with drugs that are activated by this enzyme. And with, in the case of ultra-rapid metabolizers, it's on the opposite. So, um, um, these are um, a classical examples of uh, pharmacogenetics, which we're focusing on a um, monogenetic traits. Now, cancer is truly the ultimate example of polygenic disease with many genes involved. And the complexity of molecular biology of cancer stems from the fact that in addition to polygenic nature, mutations in a broad sense of the word uh, can take place on all levels. It can be on the genome level, it can be point mutations on the transcriptome level through generation of um, different splice variants, on the pulse transcriptional level, on epigenetic changes, as well as on the um, protein level. And so, um, Modern technologies do enable screening for all types of these mutations, which can represent individual types of uh, biomarkers. And so I just want to show you this slide. This is, um, um, this is an, a breast cancer amplicon, um, just a structure of this amplicon, and it shows you how complex may be the, um, um, the structure of a cancer genome. So you see that uh, this amplicon is composed of many parts of the human genome that are concatenated together. And uh, um, these arrangements can give rise to fusion uh, transcripts and then uh, fusion proteins, etc. And so it just emphasizes one of the greatest challenges in cancer genomics, to reconstruct cancer genome and transcriptome and to be able to use this information to generate different types of biomarkers. Yes? Amplicon. So, um, amplicon is the part of the genome that gets amplified or increased in copy number. And so, originally, um, it was thought that a particular intact region of the genome was amplified to increase the copy number of some, say, oncogene, for example. But then, when people started looking um, into the structure of those amplicons, it became clear that these actually not intact regions of the genome, but rather um, actually um, regions that are reshuffled. So they are composed of um, regions from um, different distinct regions of the genome. But yet, they're still referred to as amplicons. So gene expression profiles have been widely used for um, development of expression-based biomarkers. And here you see the expression pattern of breast cancers, which you probably have seen earlier during uh, this course, with a number of distinct subtypes. Uh, here you see basal or B2 positive luminal cancers. So basically breast cancer is a very good example of um, um, presence of um, distinct histological subtypes that are um, characterized by distinct gene expression profiles. And certainly, gene expression profiles are uh, widely used um, uh, to develop biomarkers to discriminate subtypes of cancers, which in turn have um, distinct clinical outcomes.
And so basically here you see Kaplan-Maya curve right there for, um, for distinct histological subtypes of breast cancer. Um, luminal A, luminal B, basal, and ERB2, which have um, completely different survival experience, and we will talk about the Kaplan-Maya curve in greater detail later. So, um, um, in this case, um, what I also want to point out is that uh, many researchers have also observed that integration of different data types can increase our power um, to develop um, um, robust um, biomarkers. And in this case, you can see that, um, in particular, luminal A um, uh, subtype, which was defined by gene expression profiles, um, was um, split into two subsets of um, luminal A's that had a large number of um, 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 high copy gains in the genomes and the other subset which did not have those. And clearly these two subsets of luminal A's also had quite significantly different survival experience. So molecular profiling technologies now enable very detailed characterization of cancer genomes and transcriptomes and this knowledge can lead to the development of clinical tests and um, potentially guide patient management. And I just want to bring one um, very bright example, um, one of the earlier successes on this front, which is HER2 or ERB2 and the trastuzumab story. So the ERB2 or HER2 receptor is a cell surface receptor tyrosine kinase, a member of the ERB family. Um, its overexpression results in activation of intracellular signaling through a number of pathways to promote cell division, cell growth, and inhibit apoptosis. In 1987, Dennis Slamon has uh, reported in Science that HER2 was overexpressed up to about 20 copies um, in about 30% of breast cancer patients. And this um, amplification was associated with shorter survival and relapse times. In 1990, Genentech develops humanized monoclonal antibody against HER2 receptor, and it was shown to be effective only in few percent of patients even bearing HER2 amplification. Um, at the same time, methods to detect HER2 amplifications with fish and protein levels with uh, immunohistochemistry approaches was under the development, and in 1992, the trastuzumab, the uh, targeted antibody um, against HER2, went into the clinical trials. And nowadays, um, the standard of care includes a combination of a test for HER2 expression status together with a Herceptin in combination with other drugs. And uh, here on this slide, I want to show you the efficacy of a Herceptin drug alone in yellow and in combination with, um, um, with a number of other drugs. And so, as I mentioned, um, the response rate for the Herceptin alone was relatively low, even for the HER2 positive patients. Here you see it was lower than 30 percent, but at the same time, um, the rate, uh, the response rate increased significantly for a combination therapy which reached around 60-70%, and that was a huge success. So, so um, um, there is a, a huge number of studies devoted to the detection or development of biomarkers for cancer. Um, and this number is actually daunting. Thousands and thousands of publications you can find in, in PubMed. So, but I think I think it's good to ask ourselves: Do we really um, um, manage cancer well, and how um, how this knowledge is affecting the efficacy of um, managing cancer? So this is the statistics that one can find on um, the um, cancer Canadian Cancer Society website. I think this is very useful uh, statistics that one. Um, that works in cancer research area would like to um, review occasionally. This is actually quite curious statistics. And on this slide, I give you um, statistics on incidence and mortality rates for men for selected cancer types. And for instance, for prostate cancer, so I, I want to draw your attention to a couple of cancer types. This is prostate and this is lung cancer, which I will talk about briefly. So for prostate cancer, 
With the advent of the PSA screen in 1993, more early stage cancers could be detected, which resulted in this spike of incidence rate. But it was rapidly realized that PSA is not always associated with malignant disease, and therefore we can see the decline in the incidence rate in the uh, following couple of years. So, but if you take a look at the mortality rate for prostate cancer, it is changing a bit, it's declining just a little bit, but not much really. And the reason is that we're still not doing a great job at distinguishing aggressive cancers from indolent cancers. Lung cancer is another example. Um, so um, both incidence rates and mortality rates are going down over the last couple of decades from what you can see here, incidence rate and mortality rate right there. And this is most likely attributed to the recognition of the risk factors such as smoking, which influence the awareness within male population who just uh, stopped smoking. So what's happening in women? Um, the introduction of the mammography was a milestone for breast cancer management, um, providing means to detect cancers at earlier stage, um, which is a way more curable. And indeed, the mortality rate went down a little bit, but still, um, we cannot say that breast cancer is eradicated. And again, the reason is that um, we lack biomarkers that describe aggressive um, disease and can distinguish aggressive disease from indolent disease. For the lung cancer statistics, it's actually quite curious. Unlike men, for women, the lung cancer incidence and mortality rate is steadily increasing. You see it here and, and then here. So this can be explained by a uh, vast feminization taking place during uh, years from 1980s and on. So despite all of the awareness of the smoking um, as a risk factor, women still choose to smoke. So, and this is the, um, the summary of all of the uh, rates in, in men here and in women on the right um, with the uh, mortality down there and the incidence rate um, um, in the uh, top part of the slide. And so uh, when we correct for the aging population and population growth, we still can see that um, the incidence rate is growing a little bit and perhaps um, uh, declining a little bit here. Um, the mortality rate is a bit declining, but it's just really a minor change. But overall, we can say that the incidence and mortality rates stay more or less constant. So, indeed, we still need novel prognostic and therapeutic um, biomarkers, about which we'll talk in the next part of, the, um, of my um, module. So, um, how can we go from molecular profiles to classification and prediction, and what these problems are, basically, what they are about? So, the main statistical problems in classification um, in general and in tumor classification in particular include the following uh, problems. Identification of new or unknown classes using molecular profiles, and that will be called unsupervised learning. Classification into known classes, and that will be called discrimination analysis or supervised learning. And then identification of markers that characterize classes, which is called variable selection. Yes. Uh, one thing that I'm wondering, uh, <coughs> about identifying new classes, uh, unknown classes. Uh, we, have, we had one talk by, by Sora uh, where they defined 10 different subgroups and so on. But, but these are all statistically significant differences, but how many groups? Like if you have, if you have a hundred patients, do you want a hundred subgroups or do you want two subgroups or what? Like um, well, um, that's that's a that's a tricky question. So it has um, you know the biological aspect and it also has computational aspect. Mm -hmm. So from computational aspect uh, point of view, you can choose how many classes you would like to see. So, for instance, you say, I expect within this cohort to have three, four, well, at most five subgroups, 
And I don't really want to uh, subdivide the patient cohort into more subgroups than that. So this is from the computational point of view. Now, from the biological point of view, this is the question you want to answer, right? So um, you would like to find um, how many subtypes of cancer you have in your cohort of patients. And by applying different approaches, um, different cutoffs, different trade-offs, you can um, basically um, you can find out what is the most probable number of subgroups, of subsets of patients in your cohort. So it, it's not going to be um, 100 patients, um, each patient representing an individual group, right? It's going to be some limited number of subgroups. But are we talking about the different groups that will be treated distinctly differently, uh, get the completely uh, the first patient, the first group of patients gets to treat with ABC, and the next group gets DEF, and uh, they'll, they'll do distinctly differently based on these? Well, if if they bear certain mutations in the broad word, um, in the broad um, sense of a word, that would um, indicate that a certain therapy will work for those patients, then yes. But um, uh, here, you know, um, we're talking about classification, so let's just abstract from the therapy and treatment of patients. It is just generally classification problem that we're talking about. Okay, and so first, uh, the, the goal in the unsupervised learning <coughs> is to find those novel classes based on the molecular profiles and then, um, um, you know, to identify um, molecular abnormalities that are characteristic to each of them, whether they have different outcomes, those sub, uh, subgroups of patients, and then do a number of downstream analysis with it. So, but uh, today I will be talking about the second um, scenario, classification into known classes. So um, Sorab and others, I think, have introduced you to um, the identification of new classes through clustering algorithms and so on and so forth. So today we'll be talking about uh, discrimination um, and prediction. Okay? So, <clears throat> so what is the discrimination and prediction and how is it done? So we start with um, expression profiles of um, two groups of patients. Say one group is poor response to drug, another group is good response to drug, or it can be um, a set of cancer samples versus a set of normal samples. And using these gene expression profiles, we build a classifier. Um, <coughs> which is a set of genes which expression pattern describes the two groups the best. And then the classifier um, can be applied to a new patient um, um, with, uh, with its molecular profile to answer the question, what is the most likely response um, for that patient based on the um, behavior of that classifier in that new patient. So this part is called discrimination and this part is called prediction. So for um, building a classifier, we need a uh, classification rule which is composed of two components, classification method and feature selection. So there's a great number of different classification algorithms out there, probably some hundred of them, and um, these are the most commonly used ones. And instead of describing them in detail, um, I, will, um, I will just refer you to a very nice paper um, uh, written by um, pretty uh, prominent statisticians at UC Berkeley, and they not only describe those methods in detail, but they also provide you a comparison of these. What I will just um, say is that um, these are relatively uh, simple methods, computationally simple methods, and um, among popular ones are linear discriminant analysis and nearest neighbor classification, whereas uh, the bottom two ones, neural networks and support vector machines, they are also quite robust and nice, but they are uh, way more um, computationally intensive and they require more bioinformatic training. 
So this is the paper that I would like to ref uh, to refer you to. Um, so basically this is a paper that was comparing different methods uh, using uh, several publicly available data sets and the conclusion they came up with is that KNN and linear discriminant analysis were uh, performing really nicely. They had the smallest error rates and um, pretty good uh, methods for um, uh, general purposes. So now moving to the feature selection which is another important component of a classification rule. So there are three main uh, classes of feature selection uh, methods. Uh, the first one is filter method, then wrapper methods, and embedded methods. So filter methods are probably the most straightforward and easy ones, and they include um, um, the filtering of um, uh, genes, if we're dealing with gene expression, that are basically irrelevant to um, the studied outcomes. So um, features or genes are scored independently. Uh, they are ranked um, according to a certain statistics and then the top N is selected uh, for being used in the classifier. And those scores may be something like t-statistics um, of differential expression between outcome groups. Uh, it can be um, uh, between group to within group variation ratio, it can be p-value. So there is a number of problems with uh, with this method. One is the redundancy. <coughs> so features are selected independently without assessing if they contribute new information. So another um, pitfall is that interactions between features are not considered and another problem is that classification does not take part in the feature selection whereas it should but yet this is quite a straightforward method and lots of people are actually using it uh, pretty widely another type of feature selection methods is a wrapper method and that is the iterative approach um, so classification performance of many subsets of features um, is performed and then um, the best performing is selected. So the problem about this uh, approach is that it's computationally intensive and very easy to overfit. So the last method, um, in a class of methods, embedded methods, uh, it's when classification and feature selection is performed simultaneously and this improves classification accuracy and methods such as KNN and LDA actually examples of, of the methods that do exactly um, that. So this slide illustrates the filtering method of feature selection. So this is a correlation matrix of some 3,500 different genes um, from uh, a patient cohort that is represented by three um, subset of patients. And if you see, the correlation is actually quite poor. But then um, if we filter out genes that are uh, not differentially expressed between the groups, uh, just as one may expect, um, we can see a higher correlation. Um, and this is good. We basically have gotten, we gotten rid of uh, noisy genes, which are basically uninformative with regard to our studied groups or outcomes, and um, they will not interfere uh, in the classification uh, procedure. So, in summary, what's the goal of feature selection? To improve classification performance by removing genes that are not associated with outcome, also, it may provide useful insights into the biology of a disease and um, can lead to the diagnostic tests such as breast cancer chip. So this is how it's normally done. So now moving on to the general strategy of building a classifier. So this slide shows um, basic components of this procedure. So we start with a learning set <coughs> of our samples. So and we build a classifier using molecular profiles uh, obtained for samples in that uh, set, which sometimes is referred to as training set or learning set. And then we evaluate the performance of this classifier, how well it can discriminate um, 
outcomes in a totally independent set, which is called test set. And the error rates of um, classification with this classifier um, on the learning set and on the test set um, um, contribute to the overall performance assessment. So this is the ideal case when we have two independent data sets, two independent cohorts of samples for training and for testing. But unfortunately, um, the thing is, is that independent sets of samples are rarely available and almost never at the time of the current study. So what happens more frequently is that a researcher is presented with a single set of samples and then um, um, this set is split into two. One will serve um, the purpose of learning or training um, classifier and another one will be used for testing a classifier. So in this case the test set is not um, uh, purely independent, but this is a strategy that is normally taken just um, due to the lack of um, any better approach um, um, or any any better um, uh, selection of um, sample sets. And then um, the uh, the testing again of the classifier on the test set and on the training set um, contributes to the performance. Uh, um, um, assessment. So the pitfall in this strategy is we basically um, effectively reduce um, the sample sizes for learning and for the test sets, which is sad, but um, that's what needs to be done. The essential part of the classification procedure is a performance assessment, and it consists of the following components. So we would like to answer questions about classifier, um, how accurate a classifier is. And for that purpose, we use confusion matrix or um, um, metrics such as accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and so on. Another question that one may ask is how well classifier worked on learning set and that will be called a resubstitution error rate. So this is the one that I showed you here. It's right here, error rate, resubstitution error rate. And since it's um, from the testing, evaluating of a classifier on the data set on which the classifier was trained on, this is very optimistic um, estimate. <clears throat> Um, more realistic estimate is uh, how well classify worked on test set. Um, so here, error rate that comes from here, so when we test classifier on the test set. And then other methods to evaluate a classifier is cross-validation. And certainly when we build a classifier, we would like to compare it with other classification methods. And for that purpose, we use rock curves, for instance. Essentially asking the question, how well is the group uh, doing that? You're not really saying anything about what it means in a clinical setting. Like, what, 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 like, if you have two groups of patients and you define one group as blue patients, the other group as green patients, like, and you find out that it's really good at uh, differentiating between green and blue patients, but if they don't live longer, if they don't respond differently to treatment, if they don't uh, <coughs> like, there should be some failure. Why is there no element of testing what it means? So you're probably referring to the um, um, to the other aspects of this analysis. So certainly when you look for uh, subgroups of patients, you would like to see whether they are clinically relevant okay. subgroups. Okay. Right. So, um, so let me just give you this scenario. Uh, probably um, this is something that you're trying to um, to get at. So um, you have a cohort of 100 patients and you do molecular profiling. Then um, you know almost nothing about these patients, right? Just with exception that it's, say, breast cancer, prostate cancer. 
So then you do an unsupervised clustering and you find two very strong um, expression-based subgroups of patients. So what does it mean? Are they clinically relevant subgroups? So what you do next is that you take these subgroups of patients and explore their survival experience through the kaplan meier curves, for instance. And then you see that these, say, two subgroups have significantly different kaplan meier curves. And you conclude, yes, um, I have discovered a um, uh, subgroups of patients that are associated with poor or good survival. What we are talking now is a details of how to perform discrimination and prediction when you already found your subgroups and you convinced yourself that they are clinically relevant or interesting biologically or otherwise. So, and this is the detailed process how to build classifier that will describe those two groups the best and will be um, applicable to any new patient that will come and we will like to predict their survival, for instance. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> so now this is a confusion matrix. Uh, that is very um, uh, nice uh, table. Uh, this is basically a visualization tool um, that is typically used in a supervised learning. So columns represent um, the instances in actual classes and rows represent the instances in predicted classes. So for instance, we are developing a new biomarker to predict something. And uh, we compare it with a golden standard um, approach, such as, you know, histopathology, for instance, where patients are evaluated, um, the samples evaluated and um, diagnosed either as cancer positive or normal negative. And then we would like to see how well our biomarker is uh, performing for this particular task of discriminating cancer versus normal, for instance. So, um, <clears throat> a confusion matrix uh, displays the number of correct and incorrect predictions made by our uh, biomarker model compared with the actual classifications. Um, and the actual classification is here again. So, we have, um, uh, by histopathology, we have uh, this number of uh, cancers and this number of normals. and. Um, by our biomarkers, we can predict um, this many of um, um, true cancers as um, um, being cancers, indeed, and, and then um, the rest is false positives, and so on and so forth. So this is true negative, and this is false negative. So I will give you just an example um, and what we can do with the confusion matrix. So. From the confusion matrix, we can derive four important statistics. And these statistics basically come, uh, they are derived from fractions of these red colors here, um, from the total of columns and total of rows. So from here, we can derive sensitivity and specificity. And out of these, we can derive accuracy of a biomarker um, or classifier. And from rows, we can derive positive predictive value and negative predictive value, which are more important um, metrics than sensitivity and specificity. I will um, explain to you why. So basically, the sensitivity is the proportion of positives who are correctly identified by the test. Sensitivity is the proportion of positives that are correctly predicted by our test. And specificity is the proportion of uh, true negatives that were correctly predicted by our test. And then the positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Uh, so positive predictive value is the proportion of patients with positive test who are um, correctly diagnosed. So I won't confuse you any longer. Um, um, so we'll just uh, see the example here, how the thing is calculated. 
so basically you see uh, that we are comparing uh, endoscopy with um, some new test here and uh, here we have true positives false negatives, false positives, and true negatives. And from here, it's very easy to derive sensitivity, specificity, and then PPV and NPV. So the PPV and NPV are mostly, um, are most commonly used by clinicians because they um, take into account the prevalence of the disease, which is basically um, the frequency of the disease in a population, which is quite important. Um, uh, uh, unlike sensitivity and specificity. Um, so these are the metrics that you will often find in medical literature uh, that describes any um, uh, classification studies or new biomarkers. Do you also look at precision, <coughs> Sorry? Do you also look at precision and recall? Precision at? And recall. And recall? Mm -hmm. And what's that? Oh, that's just like just you do um, true positives divided by true positive plus false positives. In text mining, people usually use that. Oh, oh, I because see. Because what, when you use those things, you get really high numbers. Mm. Well, um, w what I can tell um, <coughs> is that um, if you are a bioinformatician and you derive some new biomarker and then you present it on some you know clinical me meeting and you show really nice sensitivity and specificity almost 100 percent no one will believe you so it's ppv and npv that in clinical research is the most important is the most important accuracy sometimes is um actually not sometimes quite often is used um to demonstrate um, the efficacy performance of markers, but in the end, PPV and NPV is the most important thing. So another metric that I will give uh, um, a brief summary of is the misclassification error rate that you can find in the medical literature as well, and that's basically um, a complement of accuracy, one minus accuracy. And um, we can have, as I mentioned, um, resubstitution error rate or test set error rate. And again, resubstitution error rate is very optimistic because it's applied, um, uh, it's derived from the uh, same data set on which the classifier was trained. So uh, very important internal validation of a classifier is a cross-validation. And it's performed on the training set. And virtually in every paper that you can read um, that is devoted to new classification um, algorithms or new um, uh, biomarkers, all of them will have um, one or other version of cross-validation. So the most uh, general um, uh, version of a cross-validation is V-fold cross-validation and it's performed as follows. So cases in a learning set randomly divided into V subsets of nearly equal size. Then we leave one set out and it will represent our test set. The rest um, comprise learning set for building classifier. We build classifier, then we compute the test set, um, the, the error rate on the left one out. <coughs> and then we repeat over all V sets and average error rate. That's the general um, version of uh, cross validation. Um, more uh, special case is leave one out cross validation uh, when the V folds is equal to n and n is a number of um, samples in the training set. So we basically leave one out, uh, train classifier on the rest, and then test it on one left out and repeat it um, over um, um, n times. Um, so um, there is a there is a couple of notes that I would like um, uh, to mention. Uh, so there is a bias variance trade off. So smaller v can give larger bias, but smaller variance. And also cross validation is quite computationally intensive. So this needs to be kept in mind when um, working um, on such things. So now. This slide summarizes all of the common steps in this process that I've described to you.
of building and validating classifier. So we again start with the learning uh, or training set. We build a classifier. Uh, we perform a uh, cross-validation of that classifier using learning set. Then we evaluate its performance on independent uh, test set, ideally. And then all these um, performance assessments contribute to the overall uh, performance of the classifier. So just one more note <coughs> that learning and test sets should be identically distributed. So if there is any... Um, um, any uh, additional factors such as race, age, and uh, um, you know status of certain uh, markers or hormones. This should be uh, taken into account, so um, they are identically distributed. So when we build the classifier, we would like to compare it with other uh, classification methods, and for this purpose, we use rock curves. So, receiver operating curve um, um, is commonly used to evaluate um, performance of the method in comparison with other methods. And um, so this is just a graphical plot of the sensitivity or true positive rate versus uh, false positive rate right here. And so this is just the actual example of um, uh, rock curves for multiple different methods in this case and so uh, the rule of thumb is that the curve um, that approaches the left upper corner um, uh, comes from the best performing method so this is the rock space here and the diagonal line is a no discrimination line it means that any rock curve that is um, um, underneath this discrimination line so this method does not work so it does not discriminate classes at all so everything that is above the discrimination line discriminates samples um, um, or classes and again uh, the perfect classification is this point um, when we have a very high true positive rate and a minimum false positive rate so Rock curves are widely used, and I think many of you have seen rock curves anywhere at some point in time. But the question really, do we, do we realize how these rock curves are constructed? And I think it's important to understand this in order to be able to interpret your rock curves um, uh, the best. So how they are constructed is summarized in this, on this slide. So for example, we have two classes or two groups of patients and they have um, distinct distributions of a classifier value in our example let it be gene expression so and this information is given it does not change under given study so these are two subgroups of patients with these two distinct distributions of gene expression of our classifier so uh, very often these distributions overlap and it's important to find a threshold to um, call, say, um, the, you know, gene expression, um, you know, um, above the, uh, above normal, that would be an indication of cancer, for instance. And so um, the way the rock curves are generated is that we fix this threshold somewhere and then, uh, based on this threshold, we may have a certain number of uh, uh, true cancers and true normals and false cancers and false normals based on, um, based on the expression of that particular gene. And so, uh, with this fixed threshold, we construct the confusion matrix for this one instance of a threshold. And this confusion matrix gives us one point on the rock curve. And then we reiterate this process again. So we move the threshold here or there, and we construct the next confusion matrix. With uh, We get corresponding true positives, true negatives, and we get another point on the curve. So that's how, um, through multiple iterations, by shifting the threshold um, of our classifier, we build the rock curve. I have a question. What happens when you don't have a one third of 
that looks like uh, that it looks the best. You have one curve that is closer to the left part uh, on one region, and another curve that is closer to the upper part. In uh, so, how, how do you what do you consider? The, the so, how how do you choose the best performing method? So the best performing method is basically um, uh, chosen on the basis of the rock curve. And here, I'm sorry, I didn't spell this out. So um, you can summarize the rock curve with a single metric. And that would be, for instance, area under the curve. Well, let's say the area is similar. And then, so you have to think about which, you know, where you want to use the data. So there are two purposes of the rock curve. So first is to select um, your method. So, so you select it based on the metrics such as area under the curve, or some people prefer to use the complement, which is area above the curve. So, and you pick the method with the largest area under the curve. And then the second purpose is to select the threshold for your classifier. So for instance, you have distribution of a gene expression. So where do you want to set a threshold above which you will say, okay, my gene is overexpressed, right? So this is for, um, um, this is for the ultimate, you know, clinical test that will be using this gene expression, okay? And, and that's how, um, that's what you can use rock curves for. So for instance, you can say, okay, um, I will use this threshold here because I would like to achieve this true positive rate and I can still tolerate this false positive rate. And you know, uh, this trade-off between true positive rate and false positive rate is basically clinicians need to decide in terms of disease management, side effects of treatment, what is the best threshold to choose for a particular clinical test. So two main purposes of the rock curves. Thank you for bringing this up. <clears throat> so, um, so I am um, finishing uh, this part of my talk, <clears throat> and I will just like to mention um, that if you plan to um, to move into the classification and discrimination research project, I uh, I think it will be very helpful to read um, these landmark papers that were published. Um, over the last decade or so. Um, so these um, concern different cancer types and they use slightly different methods. So I think it's very useful to read through them uh, if you are to embark on uh, the research project like that. So um, these are useful references for you. So um, we're done with the, um, with, um, with the major strategy how to build classifiers, um, how to evaluate their performance. And now I would like to uh, introduce you um, to a, a special and very important research field uh, which receives a lot of attention uh, and uh, it's very important uh, part of translational research uh, in conjunction with clinical trials and that is predicting the response to therapy or drug response studies as they are often referred to. So this um, area of research uh, does involve the same classification studies as I um, described to you, um, such as whether the patient will respond or not to the given therapy. But in the reality, there is a number of subtleties. Uh, there is a number of challenges there that make this research field a special case. And I would like to highlight this for you. So. Patients with clinically similar diseases often respond differently to the same therapy. And actually, as of yesterday, you heard um, uh, quite a bright example of um, a patient who has the same or cancer type that is characterized with the same mutation, um, which indicates a particular targeted therapy that works for other cancer types or other patients, but still does not work for a particular, for a given patient. And so, we, um, so this is certainly due to the number of factors that have been described throughout this course. Um, um, for cancer patients in particular, this is due to different molecular determinants of the disease or different subsets of molecular abnormalities that um, happen in each individual tumor. So cancer treatment will be effective if it will target disease-causing genes 
in a given patient. Um, and also, um, the treatment is associated with um, toxic side effects, right? So, um, it is very important in the post diagnosis phase of patient management uh, to choose the appropriate therapy and to be able to predict whether it will be effective. So, and this involves the development of markers of drug response and uh, then uh, predicting either um, whether the patient respond at all or not and in that case it will be a classification problem or uh, it can be a regression problem when we would like to predict the actual amount of the response which is also possible it's a bit more challenging but it's also possible so this diagram shows the ideal scenario that I already showed to you before when we have two independent sets and of samples and these sets of samples um, are clinical samples so they come from patients and um, ideally these patients in two independent cohorts are treated with the same regimen, with the same therapy, uh, the same drug, with, with the same uh, regimen. But unfortunately this um, uh, rarely happens in the reality. What's um, more um, uh, common that researchers um, are uh, presented with is that um, we need to build classifier or predictor of response using patient samples, uh, I'm sorry, cell lines, and then um, evaluate the performance um, or test the performance on patient samples. It can also be another scenario when we're dealing with mixed cancer types, um, and then we need to apply um, the, to predict response in a single cancer type. Um, also, uh, there is a possible scenario of building a um, predictor of response um, using cohort that is treated with combination therapy and then evaluating it on a cohort that was treated with monotherapy and um, vice versa. So different scenarios are possible. Also, um, uh, when it comes to the response, um, uh, different metrics can also be used. So for cell lines, um, it can be um, something simple such as GI50 growth inhibition by 50%, TGI or ELSA50, etc. Um, and then um, the researcher would basically set a certain threshold to call uh, resistant lines and sensitive lines based on these uh, metrics. For patients, it may be a bit more complicated. Um, it can be a uh, time to the progression it can be overall survival, it can be arbitrarily assignment based on uh, post-treatment uh, tumor volume, it can be pathological complete response, it can be residual disease, etc., etc. So um, what's important um, to, uh, um, to have in mind um, is that uh, performance evaluation of predictive markers um, 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 should be um, so the evaluation of the performance should be um, based on the same um, on the same response metrics. So whenever you um, uh, um, have your training set and then your test set, uh, the same um, metrics for response have to be chosen for individual um, sets of patients, and that's quite important. Uh, because the performance of a um, classifier will depend on the chosen metric. So I will, yeah. Um, so it's growth inhibition by 50%. So the cells are treated with a drug and then, um, and then um, the inhibition of growth of cells is measured and uh, mm -hmm. usually it's um, the 50% um, that is used as a metric. So I will um, um, I will say a few words about cell lines um, as model systems that are widely used for drug response studies. Um, this is invaluable resource. Uh, there are pros and cons. Um, 
in using cell lines in such studies. So um, the pros includes um, um, the following things. So cell lines are more readily available than patient um, cohorts and they're very easy uh, to manipulate and they provided limited su uh, supply. They also often very thoroughly characterized models and so a number of uh, different molecular profiles are usually available for uh, cell lines. Um, then cell lines enable prediction of response to novel therapies, um, single or in combination, whereas it's not always possible for patients. <coughs> also, they allow high throughput screening of thousands of new drugs. So these are model systems, and I will show you what resources are available for that. Um, also, um, we can uh, identify new uses of established agents, uh, which is quite challenging because in order to go uh, across cancer types, um, we need FDA approval, which is a very um, costly and a very time-consuming process. And also, cell lines can be used to provide useful insights into mechanisms of drug action. Um, so the cons of using cell lines um, certainly exist and among them is um, the fact that cell lines represent a small uh, minority of uh, heterogene heterogeneous tumor populations and that are not available for all of the cancer types and cancer subtypes. Also, um, the um, pitfall um, is that cell lines um, usually selected and adapted for cell culture conditions and they may not respond similarly to drugs as cancer cells growing in human host. Um, also, drug exposure in vitro does not mimic the kinetics of drug exposure in human tumors that are influenced by a number of physiological factors. And then validation of signature in patients uh, may be actually quite difficult uh, because most clinical um, uh, efficacy trials are carried out with uh, drug combinations and you know very often uh, researchers start with um, um, uh, single agent treatment uh, of cell lines. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So overall like historically how successful have cell lines been in predicting human response? I will show you some examples. This is a very good question. I will show you. So um, um, there are resources um, um, that provide um, um, valuable um, information on the response to a um, uh, wide range of drugs. Um, and so um, one of those resources is the, uh, the Developmental um, uh, Therapeutics Program, DTP, that was established at NCI in 1990s. Um, and the main goal of, of that program is to identify and evaluate novel chemical leads and biological mechanisms of their action. So um, this resource is built um, on the NCI-60 cancer cell lines panel, which represents a um, certain number of um, cancer types. Um, sorry, uh-huh. Um, and so basically this project is designed to screen large number of compounds, some 3,000 uh, compounds per year, uh, for potential anti-cancer activity. Um, so I also uh, have to mention that uh, recently, um, this year, um, uh, Novartis Pharmaceutical in uh, collaboration with Broad Institute has released um, another extraordinary resource which is called um, Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia which is comprised of some thousand different cancer cell lines that are treated with um, a large number of um, widely used anti-cancer um, agents and this is a public resource that everyone can use um, uh, to perform uh, drug response studies so this is really invaluable uh, resource. So um, various gene signatures and sequence alterations in target genes have been obtained for prediction of drug response in patients. Uh, in many of these markers were both trained and tested on primary tumor samples, which is great. Um, and um, they provided 
um, uh, nice reproducibility. Um, and so if, um, if the reproducibility is proved to be um, stable across many independent data sets, then they can provide um, new ways to design and carry out clinical trials. And this table shows many, many different studies that have been um, published um, using patient cohorts. Um, at the same time, the disadvantage of these types of studies involving clinical specimens is the limitation in the number of chemotherapeutic drugs that can be tested, um, as well as their dependence on well-established and improved drug therapies. So to circumvent this, many groups have been using preclinical model cell lines um, um, to make use of um, you know, cell lines and sometimes xenografts to investigate gene expression profiles that are associated with um, sensitivity to um, certain drugs. And this can be done for hundreds or even thousands of different drugs. So, And this table um, shows you just a tip of the iceberg of uh, the studies that have been published um, um, in, in this area. So there is no golden standard at this point how to perform drug response studies. And so what I will do, I will show you a few examples of drug response studies so that you can see what challenges people are presented with and how they try to address them. So one example um, is from the MD Anderson Cancer Center Group, um, which has a pharmacogenomic marker discovery program which studied uh, treatment of breast cancer with combination therapy. And they have published a number of papers here that you can see. Um, I will highlight just a couple of them for you. <coughs> so the first one, <coughs> uh, so here you see the um, study summary. So the group uh, embarked on developing predictors of a pathological complete response in combination uh, in response to a combination therapy using 82 breast cancer patients and validated on some 50 independent cases then they try to evaluate use of different classifiers such as SVM, KNNs and uh, linear discriminant analysis and then um, they um, uh, tried to vary the number of features that they used in classifier um, with a goal to um, pick um, the most appropriate uh, size of a classifier. Then they also examined effect of training set size and model performance and they also compared genomic predictors versus clinical predictor. So here you see that they have um, tried a, a pretty large combination of classifiers or um, classification methods um, with um, varied number of genes that they include into classifiers. So here along the x-axis you see different number of genes that they included into classifier and here you see the area above the curve which as I said has to be um, the least possible for the best performing method and here each individual curve represents um, the area under the curve for each individual um, uh, classification methods and so they have concluded that um, um, KNN, I'm sorry, DLDA was performing the best with um, size of a classifier of some 30 genes. So that's how they approached um, this question. Um, so now, I have to say that um, it's, it's also um, great to have large training data set, but it's not, it's not always um, readily available. And the big question is what should be the size of your training set so that you can get uh, nicely performing markers. So what is the minimum size of a training set that one should uh, work with? And so here they try to um, um, look into this uh, tough problem. Um, so um, they basically put both sample sets together, set aside 20 samples for test set, uh, the rest they used for uh, subsampling and training, and they did some 50 uh, iterations and they um, uh, computed the median of uh, prediction accuracy, which is represented by a red dot, and as they increased the size of the training set, they could see that the performance was steadily improving, and then um, by extrapolation, they concluded that based on the uh, 
um, on this data, um, the training size of some 200 cases would be only marginally better than set of 80 cases. Well, I have to say that this is quite creative approach, and this is probably the, the best that they could do with the data that they were presented with. But um, I have to say that uh, it's it's you know it should be taken with a good grain of salt because you can't really. Um, um, the modeling of the errors here was not modeled well enough and so it's it's really yes it is a um, an approximation and um, very optimistic one but um, in the reality uh, in order to estimate the actual performance of the markers one needs to be um, um, starting not with a reasonable training set but also markers need to be evaluated on multiple independent test sets in order to uh, see how um, it convince themselves that the um, uh, you know classifiers really work well but this is what people did and uh, I think it was quite creative so another thing that they did is they compared genomic versus clinical predictors so they used uh, the LDA method for both types of data and for genomic uh, classifiers they used 30 probe uh, classifier uh, that I showed you before and so um, basically from what you can see here on the sensitivity so this is clinical variables and these are um, the genomic predictors um, so this sensitivity, specificity, PPVs and NPV. So from what you can see, unfortunately, the genomic predictor was no better than clinical variables. So um, for the sensitivity, uh, it was uh, a bit better. But you see, the confidence interval is pretty large. And then for the PPV, the PPV was even worse. Um, NPV was a bit better. But overall, we can conclude that genomic predictors were not unfortunately better than clinical predictors and this highlights how challenging this area of research is so um, giving you yet another example from that group um, published in clinical cancer research in 2010 the motivation for that study was to investigate to what extent the cell line derived markers can predict outcome to drug response in patients this will be answering your earlier question. So uh, the way the study was designed in, is that um, they had um, breast cancer cell lines measured for response to individual drugs, the ones that are listed here, so monotherapy. And then the derived signatures were um, evaluated on clinical specimens from breast cancer patients, but treated with a combination therapy, highly challenging task. <clears throat> so this is how they proceeded through the study. So they assigned cell lines um, um, to either sensitive or resistant to drugs, and then they found informative genes, so feature selection step in two ways. So correlation with GI50 or differential expression with significant p-values uh, between sensitive and resistant. And then they constructed multi-gene classifier using DLDA approach to predict clinical response. And these metrics were used as a response uh, metric in patients. So what was the conclusion? They could not develop cell line derived predictors to four individual chemotherapy drugs that could predict um, response to combination therapy in patients. And probably this is not surprising now. It was very painful um, experience back then. Um, but now, um, basically, um, what's becoming clear is that uh, drug response studies have raised more questions than they've given answers. So it's still unclear whether human cell lines can be, um, you know, an adequate um, start uh, to develop markers of response uh, that can be later applied uh, to patients, then what metrics should be used um, for cell lines? Is it IC50? Is it GI50? Is it uh, some combination of all of the metrics? Is the response curve should be taking into account um, um, uh, altogether? And then 
Another very important question, what is the best measure of response in vivo? As I described to you for patients, it can be multiple different metrics that one can use. And probably this is a very tough question, and I would just say that uh, the way to go is just to be consistent um, between data sets and just to stick to one uh, response metric, and that uh, will be a solution for now. And um, also a bit of a, uh, you know, more of a fundamental biological question, I would say, is that whether signatures of response um, in a particular, um, specific to a particular cancer type, or can it be, um, uh, you know, cross cancer types, so can it be applied to other cancer types? So these are the questions that still exist and people are trying to address them. When you say breast cancer cell uh, I'm sorry? When, when, when they say here breast cancer cell where you see what, what breast cancer cell I so many with different genetic background and genetic profile features. Yeah, different so. Different cell lines will, will provide, breast cancer cell will provide different results. I, I yeah, yeah, but um, certainly uh, there is only limited collection of uh, breast cancer cell lines. And this is true for any cancer type. And so the the more comprehensive your collection, the better. So you can um, uh, find more significant associations um, between response and molecular profiles if you have comprehensive collection. <coughs> but at that point, um, I think they have a collection of some 30 cell lines, I think. Uh, 30, of 30 or 50 maybe cell lines, about that range. and. This is all that they had. So, um, so no, people. You can, you can look at the expression profile for the cancer of your cell and also the video of your cell and see whether it's a better model for this or that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so if you if you know your patient cohort pretty well and you know that, for instance, it's represented by um, certain subtypes, then you would like. Um, to have the same subtypes represented in your uh, cell line collection as well to account for um, uh, differences in response in different subtypes. So, but if it's possible, then it's great to take into account. If it's not possible, and often it's not possible, people just start with whatever they have. And that in part explains why it is so hard <coughs> to go from cell lines to patients. But people really need to do that because there is no other patient cohort, so they, and they need to start with something. So, and probably it is better if you have a collection of uh, clinical samples and of 30. You can't really imagine splitting this data set into yet two smaller sets and using one for training and another for testing. So it's, it's, it's a trade-off you know, that researcher has to um, resolve and, you know, decide what would be the best strategy. Any other question? Yeah. And the study you provided was, I think, um, with respect to the regions. And so I'm wondering if, um, if, uh, if you take like, the target therapies, for instance, if you might expect the use of cell lines in their application is to actually change a bit more because now it seems like more and more therapies are going to be targeted and it didn't, then it just seems like um, that maybe you would expect the response to the, the extrapolation to, 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 to change, you know, if, if it's not as general as safe. So I, I'm not sure if I'm following your question. So is it regarding the um, whether it will be more um, uh, appropriate to stick to the monotherapy and cell lines may be more promising? Well, um, I guess I'm, yeah, I guess I'm, with the study that you profiled, uh -huh. I, I, I'm not familiar with a lot of these agents, but they're, they're chemotherapeutic agents, which means, are, I mean, they're, um, and how, I guess, how, how I define that with chemotherapy, um, a lot of traditional chemotherapies is they're not targeting, like, maybe specific Please, ah. right? So I'm wondering, with a lot of the drugs now that are being developed, they're very targeted. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, I'm, I'm wondering if the potential to use cell lines, um, you know, might 
might be a little bit more promising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> well, you know, it depends on the drug, actually. It depends on the drug and on the particular compound. So, um, even if it's, you know, even if it's targeted, um, it's not always the case um, that the response is actually... Um, um, you know, defined by very limited number of, um, um, you know, pathways or maybe critical nodes in that pathway. So, for instance, the PI3 kinase inhibitors, there is, uh, you know, a wide range of isoform specific uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, and uh, the response to those highly um, targeted compounds may be quite complex and it will be defined by a particular genotype and spectrum of molecular characteristics of a given cell line or tumor um, uh, and, and those things will define the response and very often it can be through totally different pathways so well PI3 kinase uh, inhibitors are quite complex in this regard so uh, this is a very complex pathway anyway um, another example for instance you know the um, chaperone um, inhibitors such as HSP 90 inhibitors which are widely used by Novartis for instance and uh, other pharmaceutical companies so um, um, these may be even more complex because chaperones um, um, they basically uh, maintain uh, a structure of many client proteins, which may be part of vastly different pathways. And, and again, response to those inhibitors may be even more challenging to predict. But um, certainly, I mean, this is, you know, um, an area of research that receives lots and lots of attention. And I think with more people... Um, uh, devoted to this particular topic and resources such as uh, uh, encyclopedia, Celine Encyclopedia, released by Novartis and Broad. I think um, I think we will be um, um, better off in a few years <laughs> to answer to answer these questions. So, um, what I also want to um, uh, highlight for you is that. Um, <laughs> This is really very um, uh, challenging field, and uh, certainly it's not um, devoid of um, errors. And uh, sometimes these are actually um, um, quite sad errors. And um, I will <coughs> tell you um, this um, story um, from the Duke University research program. Um, so um, this is from. Um, the um, uh, statistical um, and Department of uh, Bioinformatics and Genomics at Duke University, who has published a um, number of papers devoted to um, uh, development of predictors of response from cell lines and validating them on patient samples. So as you see, they have published a number of uh, um, uh, papers uh, over these years and um, often in actually very high-end journals such as Nature and Nature Medicine. So um, just um, um, to uh, give you an idea what it was about. So in 2006, uh, this group developed a method that was able to build promising um, predictors of response from NCI 60 cell line uh, panel and validated on patient tumors um, to these individual drugs. And from what you can see, sensitivity and specificity, PPV, are actually quite awesome. So then the approach was named by Discover Magazine as one of the uh, top six genetic stories of 2006. Uh, in 2007, they used the same approach to develop signatures of response to other drugs, and this spawns clinical trials in U.S. to assign subjects to either um, this arm to uh, uh, to use a combination of uh, pemetrexate with gemcitabin or cisplatin with gemcitabin, um, using genomic-based platinum predictor uh, to determine chemotherapy sensitivity. Then, in 2007, they provided a so-called validation of the combination approach using, um, using it to predict patient response um, to two other uh, alternative therapies. 
And this report um, was a sub-study of yet another clinical trial, this time in Europe. In 2009, um, they used uh, the same approach to construct a signature for yet another drug. And so overall, over these years, um, the method that this group has introduced and has been using uh, provided good predictions in independent test sets, has some biological plausibility, appeared to be um, giving stable results over years of application, and in principle was um, um, applicable to guide treatment in patients. So what happens next um, is, is that um, already in 2007, Papers have started to emerge suggesting that um, the Duke University um, studies may be flawed because um, it seems uh, to be very hard to reproduce the findings and the method itself seems to be quite convoluted. And um, in 2008 and 2009, a group of statisticians from MD Anderson has published a number of reports um, that were a complete rebuttals of the Duke University research. So they have published devastating details of um, flawed experiments and flawed study designs and um, it was just devastating. So among the details from what you can see, it's just extraordinary. So the labels were reversed, sensitive versus resistance, incorrect use of duplicates, mislabeled samples, off by one indexing error affecting all the genes reported. The, um, and it always, you know, it very often happens when you uh, move from uh, Windows-based applications to Linux-based applications. And then um, it was found that they could report on drug A to include a heat map for drug B and a gene list for drug C. And so these were basically um, um, evident things just um, simply on the visual inspection of the data. And this list was just going on and on. So this has certainly resulted in uh, termination of clinical trials and a retraction of papers. So it was actually quite painful experience and quite um, um, shameful experience. And um, this um, um, event has uh, led to the um, uh, emergence of a special field which is now called forensic bioinformatics. Uh, when um, prominent biostatisticians uh, review um, public research papers and um, they try to reproduce findings that are reported in papers and they find pitfalls and uh, they report the findings, which I think is really a great thing to do. Um, given such a sad example of Duke University um, long-standing research over years. And so what was interesting to see um, for those uh, statisticians from MD Anderson is that um, if, if they took <coughs> some 18 quantitative papers that were published in Nature Genetics within some uh, couple of years, they found that their reproducibility was not even achievable in principle in 10 cases out of 18. This is really, really uh, very disappointing. And um, one major theme has emerged that most common errors were simple, such as a row or column offsets or uh, offset by one. And conversely, um, the most simple errors were also very common, and this could lead to a really um, um, uh, horrible consequences. So it is obvious that there is a number of challenges um, in developing markers, and specifically um, in the marker validity. And um, people recognize that um, uh, even though uh, many multi-gene uh, predictors have been uh, published and some uh, um, with very high, um, um, very robust performance uh, from the first glance. Um, accuracy is high, sensitivity is high, um, and yet 
very few are in clinical trials right now and even less in clinical practice. So, and the reason for that is poor reproducibility due to the problems in the study design, conduct and interpretation. Um, as I've given you a few examples, you could uh, clearly see that. Um, one um, um, thing to keep in mind um, when designing study like this is that only one factor should be changing between compared groups such as treatment or um, uh, infectious organism and all the rest should be um, equal so um, age or race um, etc and and then only then we can say that the difference between the groups can be attributed to the agent and not to the bias. Uh, and then um, the general guideline is that the method description should be detailed enough uh, for reproducibility and correct interpretation. Um, and people recognize three main uh, threats to the validity of markers. I will just mention them. Um, these are chance generalizability and bias. And generalizability refers to um, very important aspect of biomarkers that they can be generalizable to other data sets, to other patient cohorts. Um, so this is very important aspect that everyone is talking about um, and thinking uh, how to address that. So um, there is one nice paper here in 2005 that um, describes these challenges to the marker validity and explains what they are and um, gives a possible solution to these problems. And I will refer to these um, uh, to this uh, nice review. Um, I won't go in detail over um, these things now. What I also want to mention is that um, given such a sad example of the Duke University research, um, NCI has actually mandated Institute of Medicine to come up with a set of regulations and guidelines as to how to proceed from uh, uh, biomarker development um, through validation and then advancement into the clinical use. And so in, um, in March of this year, Institute of Medicine has published a 300-page report on this topic, um, uh, which is called Evolution of Translational Omics. And um, uh, so if you're interested, you are welcome to uh, download this is very detailed report with very nice guidelines how to proceed from discovery all the way to the clinical application. And this diagram very nicely summarizes the whole strategy that uh, people are trying now to regulate pretty tightly to avoid problems such as um, the one with Duke University. And so basically um, you can think of it as two major phases. One phase is the discovery and validation and then, what is that? Hmm? <coughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so what I will go to sort this out. You can keep talking. I'll just <coughs> so um, before proceeding uh, beyond the bright line, the bright yellow line that you saw there to um, evaluating the uh, clinical utility of markers through clinical trials. Um, a researcher and the institution itself uh, in which the researcher works now um, is responsible for conducting the discovery and validation of biomarkers in the correct way, which is outlined in this diagram. Um, so, and um, these um, the painful lessons from uh, Duke universities has been learned and they are um, widely recognized now so it is clear um, that they very often in um, research studies um, of this sort it's unclear what lines of accountability exist um, also very often um, um, we have lack of strong data management and in particular, it's very important to lock down the specific computational method that um, underlies the uh, marker classifier development. And very often, researchers tend to tweak 
the computational methods as they go and uh, the method evolves and so this basically should not happen and one of the um, uh, specific um, instructions is that uh, computational methods have to be locked down um, at the um, at the stage of the validation of biomarkers and then um, the adequate validation should take place um, and basically validation of a test that is um, potentially future clinical application that will need to be approved by FDA needs to go through a very rigorous validation at the laboratory that is CLIA certified and CLIA is a clinical lab improvement act so this is basically a set of regulations how a laboratory has to be set up what uh, reagents and what equipment it should be using and um, so the validation should take place in CLIA certified laboratory um, and only after these two phases are uh, correctly completed then we can cross the bright line and go into <coughs> clinical trials. There are different types of clinical trials that are outlined here. So these are the guidelines. So this research area is um, now becoming um, um, actually quite closely regulated and monitored um, to avoid problems and this is a great thing to see. So um, here in the next slide I will just show you very briefly the list of tools um, that are available out there um, for um, research projects like this. This is just for your reference. And this slide uh, summarizes what we have learned um, during the lectures that you have heard uh, so far. So just to summarize, um, let me go through this very quickly. Um, so despite the progress in marker development field, we still need um, uh, good new biomarkers. Um, we um, have a choice of um, many classification <coughs> discrimination methods um, and it's a, a matter of um, personal choice and um, uh, very often uh, training that one may have. Then feature selection is an important part of classification procedure. Um, also another point is that performance assessment is absolutely crucial for classifier development and consists of several uh, important components and it has to be performed correctly. And in that report, um, there are certain guidelines as to how to approach this task as well. So also it's important to recognize that there are threats to the marker validity and try to uh, work out the study design to minimize um, uh, these threats. So what can we do now with the knowledge that we have just acquired? So what I would like to do is just to give you a few examples of incorrect questions and analysis and then I would like you to contemplate over this just a little bit and perhaps come up with your own correct analysis and uh, we will work together on this. So the first question for instance, uh, does molecular profile show clusters by survival? So um, what you see uh, the researcher is doing, so select subset of genes with significant differences between uh, survival groups, uh, patients who survive long or short uh, periods of times, and they are often uh, referred to as long and short survivors. And then cluster profiles for these genes only and get clusters by survival status. So is this the correct type of the analysis? No, this is incorrect. So why? Genes were already selected by differences between survival groups, so they should cluster according to these groups. So this is an expected result. <coughs> Another example. So let's build a classifier for a rare subtype of cancer with disease prevalence of 0.2, and again prevalence is a fraction of the disease in a population, so 20% of population may contract this disease or have this uh, cancer and then assess its performance using cross-validation. So um, the approach is the following. Select equal number of patients with rare subtype of cancer and common subtype and 
that will make a disease prevalence of 0.5. Um, develop a classifier, and classifier shows high sensitivity and specificity, and to conclude from this that it's applicable as a diagnostic test. So again, this is an example of incorrect approach. So first of all, sensitivity and specificity do not depend on the population distributions. Remember, I mentioned to you that for that purpose, uh, we need to, to take into account the prevalence. And um, uh, one needs to pay attention to the PPVs and NPVs, positive predictive values and negative predictive values, to begin with. And then, uh, certainly, um, um, the distribution of our sample set should follow the distribution in population, so the disease prevalence. Right. So, um, the, uh, another example is to, uh, for instance, compare responders versus non-responders with respect to survival experience. So, in clinical trials, often patients are defined as responders um, according to um, whether tumor uh, shrunk and non-responders. Um, tumors did not change in volume, so tumors didn't shrink. So, and then uh, a researcher compares survival experience of responders versus non-responders using Kaplan-Meier curve. And then the researcher concludes that the treatment is useful. So, this is yet another example of incorrect approach. <coughs> so, there is a number of biases in here. So, first, patients had to survive a certain period of time to achieve response. And then we do not know how long would a patient survive without therapy, so maybe longer than with therapy. So uh, such a conclusion cannot be made, and this specific type of analysis has actually been banned from, um, um, you know, um, by many journals. So now, let's think of um, some correct analysis for these tasks. So what would you do for the first uh, question when we um, um, want to answer the question, um, uh, does molecular profile show clusters by survival? Any ideas? Please note peeking into the following slides because they have solutions. So can we just um, pause on this slide for a second and just think? <coughs> You can run any feature selection without looking at the labels and then class it after that. But the key is that you are not allowed to look at the labels. Exactly. Did you read the following slide? No. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So yes, that's exactly what we want to do. <coughs> so we perform unsupervised clustering of genes that are differentially expressed um, across all of the samples with uh, uh, you know, no respect to survival groups or any other outcomes, right? Just they are differentially expressed across all of the samples. Uh, and then we see if um, there is a difference in survival between observed clusters. This is actually um, similar to what I was giving you as an example. So you start with unsupervised learning and then you ask a question, okay, my uh, molecular, um, my sub groups of patients based on molecular profiles, do they have uh, clinical meaning? <coughs> so let's think about second. First one, can you also do the uh, randomly assigned patient in the probation set and over training set and probation set? Like ra random assignment for patients and clinical set and see if there's a survival difference between well, but the question is, um, you know, do molecular, are molecular profiles associated with survival somehow? So that's the question. So for that purpose, you don't really, you, you do not answer the question of what would be the best molecular uh, descriptors of your different survival groups. For that, you would need training set and test set, right? But just to answer the question whether molecular profile may be associated with survival, 
then uh, you need to do unsupervised learning first and then see if uh, your de novo discovered subgroups based on molecular profiles have clinical meaning or have different survival. Okay, so what do we do for the second thing? <coughs> so I'm showing you, huh? So we should kind of normalize for the prior problem the yeah, distribution. Disease distribution. So either prevalence. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. Either we need to have a, the same distribution for the training, or we need to apply the prior knowledge in the posterior. Uh, posterior exactly. Exactly. So we need to make sure that our sample set is representative of our population. That's for sure. <coughs> so what are we going to do for the third one? Compare responders versus non-responders with respect to survival experience. Um, well, to begin with, this is incorrect question. What would be, again, a more correct question to ask? So, um, for instance, um, can you envision comparing patients that are treated versus untreated? Yeah? What would you see, do you think? In principle, you would see a better survival for patients who are treated versus ones who are given placebo, for instance, right? And if you do see that difference, then you may conclude that, you know, treatment probably is helping these patients, right? So this is the type of question that you can ask in such circumstances. And then certainly um, when it comes to comparing responders versus non-responders, what can we do with it? So this speaks to the... Um, the material that I was talking uh, through earlier a bit, but markers of response, right? So we can always use molecular profiles of patients who respond and those who do not respond to develop markers of response. So, so this is what you can do if you present it with, um, you know, with the data or a collection of samples like this. Okay, so. If you don't have any questions, we can um, uh, finish with this part. So here I'm giving you a list of references. This is just for your reference. Um, <coughs> um, these are the ones that I used in my presentation. Uh, these are quite good papers uh, to go over. So now we will um, switch to uh, the next part of this module, which will be um, devoted to uh, statistical methods that are commonly used for um, analysis of clinical data. And more specifically, it will be devoted to the survival analysis. And in the first part, I will go over um, the clinical data and survival analysis theory, and it will take us a bit... Um, um, just a little bit of time, about 20 minutes or so. And then we will start our lab where you will be um, uh, applying your knowledge um, um, to a specific um, data set, um, cancer patients uh, cohorts with associated clinical data. <coughs> so when we're dealing with um, uh, with clinical samples, um, we we do um, we have uh, different kinds of data associated with um, clinical samples. So we have whole genome, whole transcriptome, molecular profiling data, about which you have heard lots um, before, and then we also have clinical data, which is um, very um, um, you know tightly linked to um, the whole genome and transcriptome data, and yet it's intrinsically different. So clinical data includes a number of clinical characteristics. 
such as the ones that you see on the slide. So it can be patient ID, race, family history of disease, uh, nodal status, involvement, um, so for instance whether there are any metastasis in the lymph nodes, um, whether patient has gone through radiation or chemo uh, or hormone therapy, and then what is the stage of the tumor, what, what's the size of the tumor, what's the age of the diagnosis, etc., etc. So another type of data uh, that is part of the clinical data, but um, significantly different in nature. Uh, so uh, this data arises when interest is focused on the time taken for some event to occur. One of the most common sources of such data is when you record the time from some fixed time point, such as surgery, for instance, to the death of the subject or disease recurrence. And these are referred to as a survival times or survival data. And they require special set of statistical tools to analyze. So usually we refer to this type of analysis as survival analysis. Survival analysis has three main components or applications that are often used by researchers and are commonly seen in the literature. So one goal may be to estimate the probability of individual surviving a given time period, for instance one year, given a certain characteristics of its tumor and uh, you know physiological condition, for instance. Uh, to answer um, this question, people use Kaplan-Meier survival curves or life tables. Um, another goal may be to compare survival experience of two different groups of individuals, for instance, patients treated with drug or um, and patients given placebo. For this type of analysis, we use log rank test, which uh, compares different Kaplan-Meier curves. Have a question? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Can you use log rank for more than two? Or what would you use it? For more than two, yes, you can use it for more than two. <coughs> yes. Another uh, goal of survival analysis could be to detect clinical, genomic, epidemiologic variables, many variables, which contribute to the risk um, or associated with poor outcome. So the the other two methods cannot handle many variables at a time. And to do so, um, there is a Cox regression model, which is uh, going to be multivariable if we uh, investigate the um, contribution of multiple variables into the overall risk. So um, in clinical studies, survival times um, what are they and how they defined? So um, they are defined as the time from a fixed point to a, a fixed end point. So the examples of starting points could be a surgery, and then the end point can be death or recurrence or disease relapse. Another example of starting point could be diagnosis, and then the end point can also be um, one of those things that I have on the table. Another example is treatment. So the time when the treatment started and then uh, the time till the disease recurred. So there is one uh, intrinsic feature of survival times that make, uh, <clears throat> make it unique and unsuitable for any common statistical methods. And that is we almost never observe the event of interest in all of the subjects. So in some subjects, the disease may recur. In some of them, um, um, the disease um, is not recurring by the end of the study. And in statistics, these are called incomplete observations or censored observations. So that's why I have censoring of data here. And so this kind of data um, needs special analytical techniques. So what are the censored observations? It's, it's important to understand what they are. So they arise whenever the dependent variable of interest represents the time to a terminal event 
and the duration of the study is limited in time. And so, as I mentioned, censored observation in statistical point of view is incomplete observation. The event of interest did not occur at the time of the analysis. So what could be the examples of censored observations? It's given here in the table. So for instance, the event of interest to which we measure time is death of the disease. And the censored observation would be that the patient is still alive. So the event of interest did not occur. In social studies, it can be um, the event of interest, survival of marriage, and then the censored observations will be still married. So um, the event of interest did not occur. Another example, drop out time from school for a student. So a student is still in school. That would be an example of censored observation for that kind of studies. So there are uh, different types of censorings. There is type 1 and type 2 censoring. I will just briefly refer to it um, uh, by saying that type 1 is the most common type when the time of study is fixed rather than the proportion of subjects is fixed. Um, so in clinical, in medical research, type 1 censoring is the most common. And then uh, there is right and left censoring um, as well as interval censoring that I will uh, describe to you in a second. So <coughs> I'm sorry? It says after type 1 and 2 censoring is time fixed slash uh -huh. proportion of yeah. subjects. Yeah, so this is different type of censoring. So it's um, it refers to different, um, um, you know, design of studies, so to speak. So, um, so usually for the type 1 censoring, um, we follow up patients a long, a long time and then we fix the end point of the study and we say beyond that point in time we're not going to follow up patients any longer and so whoever was alive at that point in time we do not know when they're going to reach the event of interest in the future okay so and um, so this is the type 1 censoring right uh, there is another type of censoring when for instance um, the study is terminated at the point when, say, 50% of subjects have reached the um, event of interest. And that will be based on the proportion of subjects fixed here, what, what I have in parenthesis. And this is type 2 censoring. But what's, what's important uh, to remember is that in medical research, we're mostly dealing with type 1 censoring. <clears throat> So in the type two, it's you're measuring like the half life of the weight for fifty percent to higher. Yeah. So just you know, in, in instead of uh, fixing um, time, we're fixing the mm -hmm. proportion of uh, subjects reaching the event. Okay. So. Uh, so now, uh, left and right censoring um, and interval censoring here. So, um, so for instance, um, the examples of left censoring. So, um, so left and right censoring refers to the time continuum where the incomplete observation um, um, actually um, taking um, taken place. So with the left censoring, for instance, a patient comes to the clinic and um, with, um, with, you know, um, with, um, with a disease already. And the, the time that researcher is supposed to measure is the time from when disease actually um, emerged in a patient. But the patient has come to clinic with you know, ongoing disease already. So the disease happened sometime in the past, and when exactly, the researcher cannot say. So this is an example of left censoring. Okay, an example of the right censoring is what I just described to you. So when the study is uh, terminated at certain 
point in time, say for instance during clinical trial, some of the patients are still alive and we do not know when in the future or whether they will reach the event of interest. So whether they will die of the disease or whether the disease um, uh, recur in those patients. We do not know this at the end of the study and that's why it is called the right censoring of the data. And the interval censoring, um, which is right here, <coughs> is um, when the disease of in, um, event of interest has occurred within some interval of time and we do not know exactly when. So the example of this would be, for instance, a patient was followed up um, uh, with regard to a certain disease, cancer, and then the patient went abroad and stayed there um, for about a year and during that time uh, the disease recurred and the patient comes back sees the doctor and the doctor can say okay the disease has recurred but when exactly the doctor cannot say he just able to say that it happened within this uh, time frame of one year so and this is called interval censoring so let's see how patients proceed through study, and that will help us to understand Kaplan-Meier curves, how they're constructed, and how to interpret them. So um, this left diagram shows the time continuum and patients in the study. So uh, it shows um, the first six months during which patients were recruited to the study, and then 12 months uh, during which they were um, um, followed up. So, um, so then the patients are observed for different um, period of time, right? For each patient has um, been followed for different time. Um, so the most recently accrued patients uh, being observed for the shortest time, um, and that's what you can see here, for instance, right? So this was this patient was observed for the shortest amount of time. And now what we do, we, um, so after the end of the study, um, in the end of those 12 months here, we sort all of the patients according to the time that they were followed up. So the length of this um, uh, line is basically the time, um, um, you know, how long the patient was followed up um, in this study. So, and here what you can see <coughs> is that some of the patients have reached the um, event of interest. These are black circles. So, uh, so these patients have died of the disease. Now, um, these patients, clear circles, are censored observations that are, they are still alive. And these ones have dropped out of study. So they just moved to another country or something and they weren't followed any longer. So these are also called censored observation because we do not know what happened to them. So, and then what is the survival uh, probability for a patient? Um, so <coughs> the probability can be actually uh, calculated as a fraction um, at each um, time interval when we have exactly one uh, event of interest occurring, we can compute the proportion of patients um, uh, who have reached the event of interest of all of the patients that are still at risk. And that will give us the probability of uh, surviving um, uh, this period of time, this one. And then, um, in a similar manner, we do the same for next um, uh, time interval when another event of interest occurred, and then the next one, and the next one. Okay? And so, um, so now survival probability for a given length of time uh, so should be calculated considering these time intervals, as I just said. And then probability of survival... Um, month two is the probability of surviving month one multiplied by the probability of surviving month two. So it's basically uh, written here, the notation. So it's basically a conditional probability. 
you removed the, the dropped out from, from the probability calculation. I'm sorry? The dropped out, the two with the stars there? The mm -hmm. the yes. Oh, I see. So um, we compute these probabilities for um, time intervals when um, when there is at least one um, event of interest that had occurred. So censored observations are not taken into account. This is how it's calculated. So, uh, and, and this kind of um, calculations, proportions at every time interval, um, calculated uh, each time any single patient dies or reaches the event of interest, those uh, black circles on the previous slide, and then the series of such calculations make up a so-called life table, um, which I'm not showing you here, but it is used um, to uh, generate a Kaplan-Meier curve, which is shown on this slide. So the Kaplan-Meier curve is drawn as a step function. Um, so this drop here indicates that at this, uh, at this point in time, exactly one patient had reached a... Um, um, event of interest died, for instance, right? Um, and this is a step function because th these proportions basically do not change between these time intervals. So that's why here um, it's basically um, horizontal. So it's a step function. So um, um, the survival probability formula is right here. So it's a geometric progression of probabilities at each distinct survival time point, excluding censored observations. And the time of censored observations are usually indicated by ticks on the curve, uh, which just show at a glance the survival times of uh, surviving objects. So these small tick marks are censored observations. So, um, how can we use Kaplan-Meier curves? Um, so, f for example, um, we have two groups of patients. So, the red curve represents one group of patients, and this is um, usually referred to as survival experience of this group of patients. And the survival experience of the red group differs significantly from the survival experience of another group here. What else you can um, notice is is a different shape of these of these two curves. So this is a bit more smooth than this one, and this is because we have significantly different number of subjects in two different groups. So here we have a way less than there. So how can we use this cap and my curve? So the question is, what is the probability of a patient from red group to survive 2.5 months? So this is time, this is survival probability. So the answer is 0.5. What is the probability of a patient from the green group to survive 2.5 months? My question to you. What's the probability of a patient from the green cohort to survive 2.5 months? Exactly right here about 80 percent so and you know the more the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, separate the more differences there is between uh, groups of patients okay so this represents relatively good um, outcome <coughs> this is not very bad sometimes you can see that they actually drop very abruptly and um, this is poor survival experience group <coughs> I'm sorry? So censored observations are these tick marks. They are not taken into account when um, computing the survival um, uh, probability. So, but they, you know, they just represent the curve. So they, they are taken into account, but um, not directly. And these are these two, uh, these tick marks here. So um, for studies in which we aim to compare the survival experiences of uh, 
groups of patients. We, we can construct two Kaplan-Meier curves for, for each group or for multiple groups for that matter. Um, in, uh, in theory, um, um, we can answer the question, are survival experiences significantly different by looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves, right? But um, um, is there any other way to uh, come up with a p-value or some number that will uh, describe the differences in survival experience of two groups? And the answer to this is log-rank test which is a non-parametric method to test the null hypothesis mm, uh, that compared groups are samples from the same population with regard to the survival experience. So in other words, there is no difference in survival experience. So we're testing this null hypothesis. <coughs> so it will tell you whether there is a statistical significant difference in survival experience with attached p-value, but it won't tell you how much different um, survival experiences are. For that, there is another test. So, how we um, um, what, what's behind the log rank test? So, um, it's it's basically um, uh, based on the idea um, that we can um, take into account the entire shape of Kaplan-Meier curves uh, into consideration when we uh, answer the question whether they are different or not. So, and that is done uh, by dividing the survival time scale into intervals uh, according to the distinct observed events, ignoring censored observations again, as I show you here, right? So, um, and now we pull um, um, those intervals uh, from two groups are pulled together, so that's why you see uh, many more of them than on the red curve. So they come from green curve and from the red curve um, together. And then we compare proportions at every time interval and then summarize it across all of the intervals. And the comparison of um, proportions is very similar to chi-square test, if you remember um, um, this um, uh, basic uh, statistical test. So that's how the log rank test is done and here's the um, formula for it and you may recognize uh, this notation it's similar to the chi-square test and so basically here log rank test gives you a statistics when you compare k different groups of patients it can be two, three, five, seven and then um, you have these um, um, terms here, observed proportions and expected proportions, which have been already summed over all of the time intervals um, on the uh, time continuum. And then B is variance. And then uh, we get a um, statistics here, which we compare with the chi-square distribution, just similar to the chi-square test with chi minus one degrees of freedom. And then we get p-value, which will tell us whether there is a significant difference in survival experience between groups. So the log rank test um, is, is widely used for comparing survival and it gives you p-value. But it's only a hypothesis test, so it does not tell you how much different the survival experience is. So for that purpose we use hazard ratio, which compares two groups uh, different uh, differing in treatments or prognostic variables, etc. So um, it measures relative survival in two groups based on the complete period studied, so along the entire Kaplan Maya curve, so to speak. And so this is a simple uh, formula for that. Uh, and basically, how we interpret hazard ratio. So, what is the point three? So, uh, I'm sorry, point 43 would be a relative risk or hazard of poor outcome under the condition of group 1 um, is 43% of that of group 2. So group 1 is actually doing better by how much? By this much. Okay? And then uh, on the opposite, um, 
um, another example, it has a ratio of 2, says that um, the rate of failure in group 1 is twice the rate in group 2. So group 1 is a way higher risk group. <coughs> so um, neither of the methods that I have described to you can take into account contribution of um, uh, many variables um, into um, the risk. And for this purpose, we use Cox proportional hazard model, which specifically designed for this task. So it's used to investigate the effect of several variables in survival experience. And so um, this is a multivariable proportional hazards regression model. Um, it's also called proportional hazards model because it estimates the ratio of the risk, uh, hazard ratio or relative hazard. So there are multiple predictor uh, variables um, and the outcome variable that um, um, are in the Cox regression model analysis. So uh, let me show you this one more slide. Um, so um, uh, this is the formula of a um, hazard function. Um, it's actually quite closely related to the survival curve and represents the risk of dying in a, in a uh, time interval after a given time. And so it's a cumulative function. Um, so we can add all the hazards from zero to time t to get the risk of dying at time t. And so here what you can see in the formula, so we have um, x's are independent variables of our interest that we put into this model. And then b's are regression coefficients that are estimated by the model. Um, then there is a certain assumption uh, for a Cox regression model that the effect of variables is constant over time and additive in particular scale. And so um, another um, uh, note that hazard function is a risk of dying after a given time, assuming, assuming survival thus far, so it's conditional, like the survival function for the Kaplan-Meier. Uh, it's a cumulative function, as I mentioned, and and then survival probability can be expressed through um, uh, through this hazard function in this uh, manner, and we can basically um, plot Kaplan-Meier curves out of Cox regression model. So the Cox model is actually quite complex uh, statistical method and it must be fitted to using uh, an appropriate computer program. So the final model will yield an equation for the hazard as a function of several covariates or covariables. So how should we interpret the results of, um, of this Cox regression model? So here you see the results of the, uh, of the analysis of the uh, certain uh, clinical trial comparing um, placebo versus uh, drug treatment. And then um, the chosen model included six variables that are shown in, in this um, table. <coughs> How do people usually uh, decide which particular variables to use in a multivariable model? They, they usually um, do a univariate analysis with each individual um, uh, a contributing factor first, and if they turn out to be significant, then they put it into the multivariable analysis and do a uh, Cox regression model, uh, multivariable Cox regression model. How so, do they, sorry, how do they define significant? P value. So, um, so what's the outcome of this? Um, regression model here. So we see um, that the regression coefficient here that has been estimated by the model. Then we also get a standard error of it. And then we have a um, an very useful um, transformation exponential of the regression coefficient. So two important things about these uh, coefficients. One is the sign and then magnitude of a coefficient. 
So sign tells you um, the association with poor survival. So positive is positive association with poor survival. Negative is negative association with poor survival. And then magnitude refers to the increase in log hazard um, of, an, uh, of an increase of 1 in the value of a corresponding covariate. So in other words, if we get an increase of, say, um, I don't know, in here, an increase of 1, then uh, we'll get an, an increase in hazard by this much. And in this case, um, because it's uh, negatively associated with uh, poor outcome, then it will be 0.95, um, or 95% of the previous uh, level. So, um, so let's see, for instance, so here, um, I have expressed it in, in percent here. So for instance, here, this is negatively associated with poor outcome, right? And so if we increase the level of serum albumin by one, by one, then we get an increase in hazard. Actually, we get a decrease by 5%, right? Because it's negatively associated. And here, for instance, um, it's actually quite surprising. Um, but uh, so if we increase um, um, this by one, and in this case, um, this is a continuous variable, and um, this is um, uh, categorical, right? So it's zero or one, therapy absent or present. So it can be both ways. So in this regard, we see um, the increase of 168%. So it's, it's important to remember sign and magnitude. And the way um, we can um, um, interpret the increase and in stuff is, is given here. So if we just um, take two time points um, and, mm -hmm. and then just express it through here, then you can see um, how we get to the values here. So this is just for your reference. It's, it's not really um, necessary to understand it that well. <coughs> so therapy is, has, is positively associated with poor survival. So and then it yes. Mm -hmm. So and then um, so this is the survival. Um, uh, survival function uh, that can be expressed through um, through the hazards function that comes from Cox regression model and then we can build the Kaplan Maya curves here. <coughs> so just a few notes here that uh, power of the analysis depends on the number of terminal events for instance, deaths, higher power requires longer follow-up times, or alternatively, one can choose to use more frequent endpoints, such as recurrence, disease recurrence. And then estimation of a sample size to achieve required power is um, actually quite hard um, task. So, and I would encourage you to um, seek the um, advice of a biostatistician in this regard. So, this concludes the theoretical part of the survival analysis. I will just um, uh, would like to um, take a short break um, before we move on to the lab.